Hi, my name is Benedict for Higher Hertz. In this video, we're looking at OBXD from Disco DSP. This is of interest for a couple of reasons. One, um, it's just developed chatter suddenly in uh, forums and what have you about being free. It's, it's a bit of a blurry area, which we will have a look at, uh, but definitely you can uh, download it and use it. Uh, and also it was of interest because I just did the GeForce Oberheim SEM, and this is based around the Oberheim OBX. And there have been quite a lot of emulations over the years of Oberheim stuff and of the um, OB series of synths. And honestly, most times I walk away fairly quickly. Not because they're necessarily bad synths, but because they just don't have that kind of that you get out of a classic real Oberheim. Now, I've never owned one, never touched one, but I have plenty of records covered in them. Journey records, Van Halen's 1984, covered in Oberheim. People try to tell you it's a prophet, it's not as an Oberheim. Um, it's just really obvious when you listen to it, but it's an Oberheim. Plus, when you look at the videos, there's Eddie V with his Oberheim with some keys. I think there might be keys missing off it and everything. Uh, nonetheless, Oberheim was a massive part of the, the sound, particularly of a lot of American bands. So the question is, does this recreate that adequately, especially for the price? I gotta say that's pretty impressive. We are running through Hertz delay. They make it clear on the site that uh, this has no effect, so you're going to want to add your own. But this is normal. You bought an, an OBX or whatever, whichever version, and it didn't have effects on board. Nothing did at that time. Maybe a chorus if it was a Juno. So how you apply your effects is a lot of how you got your sound. And this is a very appropriate sort of thing, and it's warm, it is chewy, and it's varied. Listen to this. What I hope you noticed there was not how annoyingly uh, annoying and repetitive my composition was. This was deliberate playing exactly the same note, exactly the same velocity, and every note strike is different. Pitching, filters, the, the envelope speeds, everything's a little different. And this is a big part of the Obi thing. And they've done a pretty nice job of delivering that. So in that sense, we're looking at something that's a, that's a bit of a winner. Before we go into who they are, where they come from, let's have a look at presets. They are a little buried programs, and there's lots of things. <laughs> doesn't seem like that one necessarily changes anything. Accessing these is a little complex. There is a certain amount of drive inside the um, the OBX as well. I made sure that, at least in the patch that I made at the beginning there, that that wasn't uh, from external processing, wasn't from Hertz delay or anything like that. It's, it's there, and that's good, I think. Because if you listen to records with synths like this, you definitely hear drive. Like drive is an integral part of that sound. Uh, let's go back again. Blade Runner Brass, which was not an Oberheim. As far as I'm aware, it should have been a CS80. Perfect to the film, but uh, it's a nice sound. Interesting sound, very interesting timbre there. Brass. 
very famous for brass sounds. Uh, Calliope's. Um... Not the best clarinet emulation I've heard, but it's not pretending to really be one. Very playable sounds. So there's a reasonable collection. They are based more around the expectation of what you would be getting of such an instrument. So none of these that I flipped through, and I've only ever flipped through, uh, really suggest, you know, do whack 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 us paint stripper sounds. Can you make them? Probably. But in terms of something that you can pull in and say, okay, if I want anything from, uh, a, maybe not Ultravox, but Ultravox through Gary Newman, um, OMD, as I say, Journey, Kansas, any of those kinds of things, then this will take you a fair way towards that. It's relatively easy to program. Let's have a look at Disco DSP. They've been around for some time and I've actually never had any of their product. I've tried them a couple of times, didn't really work for me. This does make me wonder if I shouldn't have a look because they do seem to be continuing to update. I can see updated new versions of uh, quite a lot of their instruments. Uh, so it might be worth a look and that's probably part of why they've got this set up the way that they have because they'll draw people like me in who's gonna go, that's rather impressive and who will then hopefully look at their other product and go, yeah, I'll get that. Uh, it's based around the OBX, attempts to recreate its sound and behavior, but they've made some of their own decisions. So it's not literal or authentic and fair enough, because if we were to try to be authentic, there's really only way to do it. And that's to go out, punch Eddie V in the face, take his Oberheim off him, plug it into your own Neve or whatever they were using when they made 1984, could have been a Neve, probably more likely an SSL. Uh, and you've also then got to find all these likely effects units that were being used at that time. Kind of silly. We are in the world that we are in, so we simply say, okay, what can I access now that's going to give me the ability to access some of that feel, some of that, that depth, because we tend not to get that sort of depth out of um, standard digital synths, because sadly most of them haven't implemented this per voice move everything around thing. A few have, Diva from memory does. I didn't get into it as much as I have on this, but it is there in a few, but commonly it's something that's either not there or you have to program in by hand, which is not quite the same as a, you know, things just really get out of control um, because that's actually not very random. It's based on the laws of physics and electricity. Pricing is $49, but then it gets kind of sticky because if we have a look, they say it's free for non-commercial use. What does that mean? I'm doing a review. I get paid for these reviews by higher hertz. Does that mean it's commercial use? I write a record and I put some of this on, which I haven't yet because this is just a test. Uh, I put some of this on, I put it on Bandcamp. My album sells for $5. Is that now commercial use? Um, at what point? It's very, very unclear, uh, which means that some people are going to go around like they do with Reaper saying, oh, it's free, man, which is not cool. It's not free. There, there is a point where you really do need to pay for that as you should pay for this. But at what point are we declaring? Reaper uh, actually put a, a cap. They say if you're earning under this, yeah, you can pay the small amount, I think $60, a, a, a major version. And then the price goes up if you're earning over 20,000 a year out of using Reaper or, 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 or your music or whatever. Again, it's a little vague, but they've given us a cap. This has no sense of where that might be. So all I can say is either, guys, pop a cap in here, give us an idea where 
where we can sort of consider ourselves safely and fairly to be commercial or not commercial. Um, but ultimately, they know this relies just on the uh, well, the kindness of strangers. Um, if you are using this and getting value from it, which I can definitely perceive people could, should, would, then I think pay for it because there is some good work in here. And we'll see how well that stacks up against more serious contenders. Right, we will scoot through the usual good and bads and then really dig into the product. What do I think? I think it sounds grand. I think that it's very reasonable for realism. You know me, I never like to get into how does it compare to a real one, because hey, I don't have a real one here. And if I had four or five of the real OBXs here, I'd have five different instruments. They'd all sound different. <laughs> but my comparison is, having listened to quite a lot of records with either actual OBXs on them, and of course, similar sorts of things from that vintage, as I say, Ultravox, Gary Newman, all that kind of stuff. This is very much one of those kind of things. So it sounds grand. It's not just it sounds good, it sounds grand. And that's what you need out of an OB. There is a reasonable realism because I come over feeling very sort of 1982 out of this. It's voice variation is getting the job done. That's a real winner. And its price is really good. At $50, you get an awful lot. In comparison, the G-Force's um, SEM, which is monophonic, is $50. Uh, it's $200 for their eight voice. This is capable of playing an awful lot more voices, uh, 32, up to 32 at once, which is probably excessive. Um, is an Oberheim 8 voice and an OBX the same? No, um, but they're still very much Oberheim sound. So in terms of value, whichever way you're going, the price is very, very good for what this delivers compared to many other things that claim to deliver this better. And you've got to work out what works for you, what floats your boat. It's not for me to tell you. I can merely give my opinion is that it sounds grand. It makes me feel all kinds of like, oh, and that's cool. Negatives, well, I've got, to, I've got to scratch a little bit. I've already raised the, at what point does it become commercial usage? I think that would be very nice to clarify that or simply say it's free, but it's donation <laughs> at $50. I, I don't know. You've got to work out what you want to do with that one and how you're going to set your own threshold um, and how honest you're going to be. But please be honest, be fair because there's a lot of time and effort from a lot of people have gone into, uh, into making this instrument and it is special in its own way. If you like it, you're liking all of that work. The GUI is a little disconnected. Is that a result of the original Oberheim? I don't know, but you just have to settle. And this is not uncommon with synths, particularly of that era, because often where the knob could appear on the front board was related to printed circuit boards and, and where you could literally stick a knob on that printed circuit board. If there was a, a hub of, of bleh underneath and you couldn't put the knob there, you couldn't put the knob there. Um, unless you created a whole other daughter board or a grandchild board, um, which had an extra layer of cost, which mostly nobody wanted to spend to have the knob exactly there. So they said, okay, the knob will go over there. So we've got some things that We've got some voice variation here, and we've got some voice variation here. There are a few instances of where something is is a little disconnected. Is it going to stop you from wanting to use a synth? Maybe if you're a real newbie, yeah. But RTFM, the manual is not deep, but the manual is good in that it covers what you really need to know. Will I recommend this as my first synth? Well, that's always a hard one. The real problem for most people with the My First Synth is that they're busy saying that they don't understand it rather than just understanding it. And most simple synthesizers have some quirky things, which is part of what makes them worthwhile. Otherwise, there'd be no point in having them because they'd be like, you can't do anything interesting with them. This has some quirks, but you know, if this were your first synth, this is one that you could get. 
and keep with you through a career. That's, that's, that's a lot from me. Let's dig into what it is and how it works. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is actually get out of the way the comparison. So we'll take that off solo. I have created a patch in the Disco DSP OBXD. We'll put that there. And I have created a comparable patch. Actually, I can't remember which way I did it. Uh, but nonetheless, it's attempting to be the same patch using the GeForce Oberheim SEM, simply because I still had it on my drive from the review and it seemed kind of obvious to say, well, how do they stack up against each other, especially seeing they're at exactly the same price point. I'm not going to labor the obvious about number of voices or anything. It's all about sound. If you're chasing Oberheim, you're chasing that sound, that feel. What have we got? This is now the SEM. I think in all fairness, we can say the SEM wins. There is not necessarily a right or wrong answer here, but there's a kind of a richness, a kind of a presence that the SEM brings that, um, yeah, it just is, uh, is pretty darned awesome. But we do have the issue of our effects being different. I've used the Hertz delay twice to try to emulate roughly the effects that we've got here. So now, if we go back around again, with no effects on either. So we're just listening to the synth. This is OBX. This is the SEM. Clearly we're hearing quite a different tone. Uh, I think the Oberheim Sem is richer. It's, it's a pretty stunning emulation of what an analog synth of this type would sound like, and it's very impressive. So the more I have to be exactly the same you want to be, then the trickier it gets. But if you're prepared to, to let go of that and go your own way, there is definitely a lot to be said for this OBX. If we pull ourselves out to multiple voices, we hear the whole thing expand because we're not chopping that note off. Let's give it its uh, effects back to be, uh, no, not that one. So there is a swings and roundabouts, and you've just got to decide which floats your boat between the, uh, if you're only spending the $50 between the, the monophonic SEM, which has an advantage sonically, it, it does, um, or if you go to the 200 for the 8 voice, or stay at the $50 and, uh, and get the OBX-D, which is a fine, fine piece of kit. So now let's look through our features. We have this menu, which we've looked at. We can get into presets and what have you, those programs which are there. Um, oh, preset, but oh, there is a way of making presets. I didn't even think to click that. Okay, so you can make presets more easily visible if that uh, makes things easier for you. Okay, well done, guys. That is a little odd that it's taken off. I personally would leave it off. Might be smarter just to default it to one, but if you're kind of like me, you want the synth, not the presets. Uh, oh, there are lots of different banks. 
Okay, so there's actually a lot more sounds in here than I had thought. Themes. This is kind of cool. This looks more like a real OBX, the, the, um, the panel. It does move some knobs and buttons around. It's awfully wide. It takes a lot of real estate. Um, oh, you can change your GUI size, but one times is pretty big. This was their first GUI for this. And while it tightens things up, it just doesn't have much, much magic. There was a gray version, which again, just feels very kind of Larry. This one, which I think is probably the winner, but there is also this one. <laughs> So if we were to open this, we can see, well, not exactly the same. They've definitely made this look more like a SEM product, which is cute, but not technically accurate because the OBXs and the SEMs really were not exactly the same thing. Um, but that's kind of cool. Once, once you set the instrument to that, when you reopen, you'll find that all instances have set to that. So it's a global thing. I tried with the having one on this um, GUI, one on that GUI, um, and it was okay until I restarted things. Um, but this is a logical and neat and tidy and pretty easy to see form. Uh, you can get into MIDI, GUI size, um, tooltips. I couldn't work out what they did. And there is that manual, which is, as I say, it's not going to teach you synthesis, but it is worth reading and I think it is a necessary read. So please, RTFM, before you say you don't understand stuff, because certain things are a little unique, which is a combination of, well, this is what synths of that era were like. They were sort of sometimes reinventing the wheel or trying to do different things or deliver a more complex result with, with one knob or one button. Um, it created a lot of limits, but it created some interesting charm as well. You would do things with these because of that, that you wouldn't normally do. You know, like I've done some stuff in that patch that I made before, which I wouldn't naturally do with my Thor or Europa. Because you, why would you do it that way? But you do it that way here because that's the option you've got. Uh, so please, RTFM, because it'll help you to understand what some of these more unusual knobs are. Righty ho, to getting to the noisy bit of it. Remember, we're going to be running with an effect unit here. There is not, as far as I'm aware, a default patch. Um, we might need to change, maybe in the banks. <laughs> JP30, yes, let's make things out like a JX3P or whatever. Um, so no, can't find it. The, the, the lack of an init is is a tiny... Oh, look, right-click. We'll get this that too. I should even try to right-click. Starting again. Oscillators. So we've got a pair of oscillators, which we can assign through a mixer. So we'll get rid of oscillator 2 for the moment. Slightly unusual choice by modern standards. We've got... These oscillators, which are actually set to minus one octave, which is not uncommon on synths because being minus one octave, it sounds more. Um, but if you're looking for concert tuning or to, to be in the right octave with your other synths, you've got to actually find where that is. And because these are infinite to start with, then uh, initially that can be just a little bit frustrating. There is, however, a step button. So turn this on. It now moves in semitones, which means that if you want to tune your second oscillator against your first, you can try to do it. Which can lead to some really cool sounds, because remember, something that sounds nice and analog actually will deliver you nice out of tune sounds that sound great. Or you can put it to step. There we go, now we're in tune. You can always take it off if you want. Detune, simply detunes oscillator two. 
pushes it high compared to oscillator one. Back in these days, we did not take two oscillators and tune them out like this. All of these kinds of synths, the detune knob would take oscillator one where it is and then pull oscillator two high. So if you're wanting to emulate something like this, Jupiter 8, what have you, don't do this. That's a very EDM approach. While it can sound great, especially for strings and the like, it will not give you the authenticity of this. So your detune is operating on one oscillator tuning, and that is very appropriate for its time. So if you want both oscillators now to be at standard pitching, then <laughs> put your step button on. Now they're in normal tuning. But of course, you can then loosen them and get pretty wild with your tuning. This is the fine tune control. Your forms, you've got a sawtooth, a pulse wave, with the ability to set all pulse wave pulses. And if you turn both of these off, you get a triangle wave. There is no sine wave, just a triangle little frustrating, but really in practice, not much of a drama. Because to all intents and purposes, that's now a sine wave. And the fact that you can run things ganged is kind of cool. That's a more of an old analog synth type things. Your Thors, your Europas, your modern synths just don't do it. You have to use two oscillators to do this. I assume that these are phase locked, like an SH. And then, of course, we can do the same thing on the other side. So this is... So if you are obsessed with doing sand plus sub-oscillator, uh, then you would drop this. And that's how you do that. Personally, I'm not a big fan of sub oscillators because I think they lead to a lot of difficulties in mixes, but there are times where they do add value. But if you if you just lurch in as that's an automatic thing we must do, especially then go in unison, it, <laughs> then that's where you have a lot of difficulties with mixing because you can't get your sound to be discreet. We can sync our oscillators. Now it syncs oscillator one to two, I think it is. It's different from the original synth, but I don't care. It just gives you a practical result. So you, you're restarting the oscillator form based on the cycle of the first oscillator. Okay, whether that's proper tuning, I don't know, but they're in tune with each other, which is good enough for now. X mod is a kind of FM. It's Course FM, I don't believe it's the phase modulation Yamaha um, Casio style. It will tend to get you nasty noises. But with care, that can be quite useful, especially for bells or clangy sorts of sounds. Uh, brightness amount is uh, something they've added here. It changes the brightness of your oscillator. It's, I guess, some kind of filter, but it's not your filter. So if you felt like the comparison was too bright, then you can change that. Uh, exactly what it's doing under the hood, I don't know. I think it's just rolling off some highs. I don't feel like it's doing anything to the mids. It'd be nice if, as it changes the highs, it did something to the mids, though, then it gives us a completely different sort of timbre. 
Um, but it's there's nothing wrong with having that there. We can then assign pitch envelope, which assigns to oscillator two. It's not noted, but the fact that it's sitting under oscillator two is is reasonable enough. So our filter envelope, we can route to envelope two. As you've seen, there's a mixer for the level of oscillator one, oscillator two, and noise. It's just a straight white noise. There is no way to alter the timbre of that noise outside of your filter. Mostly where you're using noise, it is to add to an existing sound. And that little bit of noise, you shouldn't necessarily consciously be hearing it, you know, when somebody's listening to your record and you're playing your smooth jazz. You don't want them to be thinking, oh, there's noise in that oscillator. But the noise just moves things around a little bit more, and this thing moves around plenty when we get there. That's your main oscillator setup. We've then got this control section. We'll open ourselves back up again. We our bend, pitch bend, naturally moves it's one or two semitones. It's a relatively small range, not uncommon on analogs, and then we can move it up to an octave. So if you want to do the nice slide in, like in um, Eyes Without a Face, move it to one octave. You can then set it to bend only oscillator two, which is cool. Gary Newman quite commonly used a bending the oscillators to come back together. It's a nice little feature to, to have. Vibrato rate. Vibrato is set by your mod wheel only. And you can set the rate. So you've got a standalone vibrato LFO, and that's it. It's got one knob and your mod wheel to control how much of it's happening. Which does mean that if um, you're not familiar with this in your door, most doors will reset controllers on... Um, either stop, double stop, or when the door opens again, all controllers will have been reset. So if you've got a very specific sort of, I want it to be there, and then assign that mod wheel to automation and just set your value. And it can set and forget, and that is the equivalent of your now having created a knob, that's vibrato depth. Standard enough. We can now assign velocity to level and velocity to filter envelope, which we will just leap ahead for. Which means that the harder you play, the more the envelope will allow itself to open up. Not necessary as you start out, but as you start looking for more expression, so if we were to pull our filter down and be playing that nice smooth jazz. You can set those things to really add, even though quite simple, add a lot of depth and movement and variety to your playing. We'll pull them back for the moment. They don't rightly need to be in. That is your oscillator setup. Filters come next, and filters are a big part of the Oberheim thing. They are by default a 12 dB, roll off. Easy to think, oh, but, but that's, for, that's for the weak. To only have 12 dB, it needs to be 24 to be manly. Um, yeah, the, the Model D had a 24 dB roll-off and it sounds punchy. 
But one of the problems there is a Model D is not particularly nice for strings, and nor is it actually super excellent for brass. So a well-designed 12 dB roll-off, which the Oberheim was. I don't know. I don't know whether I've encountered another uh, 12 dB filter as great as the Oberheim. Uh, a lot of 12 dB filters are just an afterthought because they've gone straight to the 24 and they can make it sound like a mini. Um, and that's fine, but it, it misses out the beauty of a... Um <laughs> Plus a 12, once you get that resonant peak up, sounds much nicer in certain ways. So rather than the 12 dB being a, an afterthought here, at least in the Oberheims, the 12 dB was the thing. The 24 was like, yeah, we'll offer you one so that you don't feel the need to, to feel inferior to those Mogonas. But it does sound nice, because if you get your 12 right, your 24 is going to sound good too. So for musical sounds, things that you want to carry melody and feel, so strings, brass, anything like that where it's more about musicality than just, look how uber my sound is, then your 12 dB is where you want to start. Only go to your 24 if it's not working. But don't assume it's not working just because you don't get that punchy, punchy, punchy sort of thing. The filter is not tracked to envelope by default, and it gives you one option. Personally, I would like a... A rotary, but this makes sense for keyboards of the time. They commonly had an off, half or one third, and full. This just goes from nothing to full, meaning that it'll dull down below, although this one doesn't dull down below that much, but it'll brighten the top end. So if we're making violins or something like that. It's necessary. There is a HQ button. That makes the synth run high quality. It's not explain what that is. I assume it's oversampling. It's probably just a two times. It does sound a little softer. Um, don't notice any any movement here. I've got a, a decent decent i7. Um, I don't think it's going to cause you any problems, so if you can run with it, run with it, but if you like the sound without it, go for it. There's no right or wrong. Now the filter itself, the 12 dB, this is the multi-mode option, where we can go from low pass to high pass. High pass. It's actually a notch in the middle, so in other words it's doing this in the middle, or is a low pass. It's not really meant to be modulated in use, but there's no reason that you can't. But it is really nice for strings and the like, especially if there's then going to be some sort of further processing or what have you afterwards. We might add a little bit of vibrato, a little bit. Too much it sounds like Gary Newman, which it does there. I dream of wires. Uh, so don't feel like you aren't going to be able to do mogi sort of stuff. So you can switch and, and set your filter where you want it to be, which means that your filter is actually more versatile than just the, do I want this or do I want that? And then there is the band pass, in which case, in theory that does nothing, but it does something. I think that's narrowing the width. Well, that is definitely narrowing the width. So here you feel like, not doing anything, the width is probably like, and then it goes to super pointy. 
So again, very, very nice. You, I didn't feel like, and maybe I didn't spend enough time, but I didn't feel like the manual really made it super clear what different combinations delivered, but play with them till you find the sound. In the 24 dB mode, this actually becomes full 24 dB. This goes up to kind of like a, a six or something like that. It becomes a very mild roll off. So if your 12 is a little too aggressive for you, move to 24, raise this. Which is great for strings, really great for strings. So each of those settings has true potential for what you can do with it. And then modulation. Remember our vibrato is a, um, is a preset thing. So you've actually got your vibrato LFO, then you've got this LFO LFO, which looks a little hmm and is a little limited. However, like I said before, it's in the implementation of the limits that you get encouraged to do things you wouldn't normally do. And that's where it becomes cool. So we can assign our LFO to something. Let's set it to frequency amount. Using a sine wave, a square wave, or a random. Which is gorgeous. You can also stack up. So we can send it to oscillator two. And that's not a thing we would ever likely do. And that gives us that kind of sound that we hear coming off 80s records and go, how did they get it that good? And we start to think, oh, well, you need a real analog to do it. No, actually, you don't. You just need to know the architecture of the instrument and do odd things like this, which is a, a square wave, which you just wouldn't use for this kind of thing. And then the fact that you can track in those other couple of oscillator forms for the LFO. And that is just gorgeous. And that's only with it applied to oscillator one. If we apply it to oscillator two, it fattens it, but we might move that to applying it to oscillator two's pulse width. There's a little bit of a lumpy bumpy in there, but that's all part of how you end up with those truly fascinating sounds. So it's a funny little matrix that initially you'll think, but, 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 but they're ripping me off. But yeah, but they're giving you the, the, the tendency to do things you would not normally do. And if you want that sort of I'm 1983 sound, that's what it was like. And that is a super cool thing about this instrument. We'll take it off there and just leave that assigned there because I like that a lot. And we look at what well, amplifiers envelopes you should have worked at. The, the amp envelope. And then your filter envelope. Which you have to assign here. It's always positive. It's always going to go up. If you want it to go another way, you've just got to work out how to do that. Which probably isn't really possible and, quite honestly, not much of a big deal. It 
will click a little when you've got your attack right down at nothing. Normal enough, probably the same with release, just because you get what's called a DC click as the waveform is halfway through its cycle and you turn it on, it's like, Ugh! so just raise it a hair. Cool sound. So our envelopes, very well. Voice variation is where this really starts to come alive. We can add slop, which is to the filter. Here now, this is. That same. Now it's moving around. I've forgotten what GLD means. It's a little unclear, boys and girls. And then envelope slop. So it's changing your times for your envelopes. So if we apply a full sloppy slop, we get a really mobile sound. And that's a big part of, of true analog and very much true of the Oberheim thing, of the OBXs. They were deliberately designed like the, the, the two voice, four voice, eight voice, that each voice was going to be unique. And that part of why they stand out so incredibly well. And if you want to know, go have a listen to Van Halen's 1984 record, the first intro piece, 1984, uh, Jare Jare for sound. Uh, and then, of course, we all know, bam, 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 bam. And then Panama, and, and uh, it's just a stunning record. It's a stunning record because it's a great record, well produced, well everything. But the OBX is a big part of that sound, or whichever OB he was using. So your voice variation, really important. You also have the ability to move each of these eight voices around in pan. Use it with care. Let's just I'm hearing a bit of distortion in my cans, which you probably won't hear elsewhere. So when we play a chord, that chord is, is spread. And Oberheim were really kind of doing this sort of stuff before the whole unison kind of thing. Uh, just please don't overdo it because then it becomes hard to mix where we might be saying this sound belongs here in the mix but if it's ping-ponging all over the place, it will cause the listener to feel confused as to where that sound is, where that object is. It's like having um, having a guitar player play one note on this part of the stage, run to the other side of the stage and play another note. And you might think, wow, that's so super clever, but it's confusing for the listener. So while I've overdone it, you're generally gonna to want to keep your, your variations on the small. Idea being you just move that out a little bit. Kind of nice if there was a bypass button for these. And with that little bit of stereo, our choruses and what have you will pick that up and really amplify it. But in a nice sense of just making this smooth, broad sound rather than a ping pong random sort of a sound. And then the last one is our global. Obviously we've got our overall volume, our fine and coarse tuning for the instrument. This one is important too. This is a voice spread. This is changing the tuning. You can hear that, it's pretty marked. It's too much, so we'll pull that back a little bit. 
hear how that loosens up. It feels more real as I raise those um, those knobs. So again, in terms of a really nice, broad, nice, nice sort of feel. Let's get rid of the the, the random there. So your spread just moves things around. Yes, it does have a unison, which is takes all available voices and detunes them. Pretty standard stuff, and then you can set up your stereo spreadness through here. I think while everybody asks for that knob and button, I think if you're trying to sound like an analog synth, you probably shouldn't use it. It did appear on certain synths, Mono Poly's Jubilee has it, but the way it was used then was not the way it's used now. So if you go in and use that unison button just like it's a serum or, 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 um, or a, a super saw on a, on a JD, you're going to get a very 90s or forward sound, but you're not going to get an 80s sound. So go very cautiously with that. This is far more consistent with an 80s record. There is also a, a glide. It's fairly fast, but... Again, adds a nice little bit of movement on the beginning of that sound. We've looked at voices, and then there are various modes, because analog synths were preset in a certain mode, and as to what they did with their envelopes with um, new notes or dropped notes would define how they behaved. So again, RTFM and play with them to get a sense of... This will be more obvious with... You can hear it re-triggering the voices. Keep all means that it's going to... Leave those envelopes where they are, which can be very authentic or really annoying if you don't want it. It's a little bit more like a paraphonic in a sense, that, so your envelopes don't always re-trigger, which can give a smoother sound or a yuckier sound. It defaults to keep all, but the more voices you have assigned, the less that's actually going to bother what you're doing. I think that has got us through the instrument. So my final words on it are, I don't really care whether it's an accurate emulation of an OBX at all. There are several people who've worked through it. The guy who started the project um, had his impressions on somebody else's clone. Um, he didn't like the sound of it. So rather than bitching about it, he set out to do his own. Absolutely well done, sir. Sadly, what happened there was at KVR, he got a bollocking from a couple of, well, assholes who said, how dare you be negative about it? And it's like, all he said was his opinion. I didn't dig the way they did that. I'm going to do it myself. Can people help me? Because he didn't really know what he was doing, to be perfectly honest. But good on him. He pulled his socks up and he was very productive and he got a fair amount of his instrument done. And then he handed it off to, to Disco DSP, who did a bit more and who did what, don't know. Uh, but bottom line, we've ended up with an instrument that um, definitely holds its own. Whether you're going to like it, that would come down to, you know, what, what you like. I know there are other emulations out there that sound and feel somewhat different to this, which people will say, but they're really good quality. I don't care about whether they're good quality or not. A lot of analog gear was terrible quality in terms of high fineness. Uh, they were dirty, they were noisy, they were limited in frequency range. All the things that we would say, well, thou shalt not. Um, but that's why they sounded so amazing. This has a fair grab bag of that so amazing that when you play it, 
that, you know, I'm feeling like, oh, there's a Gary Newman record, or oh, there's a this record, there's a that record. That's what we want when we grab one of these things. Uh, doesn't mean that you can't use it to do other stuff. But I'm looking at it in terms of, well, okay, if I could get my hands on something that, that um, you know, gave that special something that we got out of an OB, this seems to do the job. So my final words are, for the price at 50 bucks, it's a very, very nice little piece of kit. It would make a pretty good starter instrument, so long as you respect it and come to accept its quirks as being positive things, rather than the, how dare it have this, that's a failing. There's a reason for everything in here. Whether you agree with the reasoning, well, that's ultimately your call, but there is a logical reason why things are the way they are, and that leads us to get results which sound like the real thing in its own way. So really pleasantly, pleasantly, pleasantly surprised by how charming, capable, and oberheimy this thing sounds. Yes, it doesn't entirely go one for one against the G-Force, but they're not really one for one anyway. Uh, but you know what? If somebody's sitting around listening to your record going, I hear you tried to emulate that particular, you know, instrument revision 47A and you're not quite right because your 2K is, you know, like 0.4 of a dB off. Thank you, sir. Would you like to buy my record or would you like to leave? Because the thing is, people who are listening to your record should be listening to your record to go, does it rock me? That's borrowing from uh, Gene Simmons, uh, because if they're not listening to it for that reason, they're of no use to, well, anyone, including themselves. So really, really quite a charming instrument. You're going to have to work out where you sit on the uh, is it commercial use or not thing. But I think the moment that you realize that you're using this a lot and it's becoming important to you and what you do, please pay these guys. I'm hoping some of the money goes to the to the originator. Because without him, while Disco may have gone on and made one of these, I think a lot of what's in here is a result of where he started, how he started, why he started. Because he said, I hear this thing, I don't like this thing, I want this thing to be something else. And then went out and made something happen. And that's 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 rock and roll, boys and girls, sitting around saying, you shouldn't to that's not rock and roll, that's just being a turdy-panted turd. Uh, so don't be that guy, please. If you are that guy and you haven't already apologized to the guy who started this, do it. Do it now before you die and you have to go to hell for it. Um, in terms of conclusion, well, as always, I hope that you have enjoyed this program, found value in it. Uh, even if it's not the instrument for you, hopefully in you know the stuff that I have talked about, you have learned some things which you can take forward to Make better music, because that's what this is all about. It's not about finding the right piece of gear or the, the right setting for this, that, and the other. It's about expressing your your thing uh, and telling your story in a unique and powerful way. This is capable of some powerful sounds, so that's a, a nice little bit of a leg up in that. As is most important, make sure that you enjoy your day.